Sometimes one little lie can sabotage our best intentions. Sometimes one little lie can bring a whole system to a standstill. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. Presented by Mark Finley. Little lies, big disasters. All you have to do is click on a little icon right here and zap, you get all your incoming messages. It happens all the time these days, of course. We're connecting to everyone through email. When I travel, I take my computer so I can keep in touch through email. But something else has been happening that can turn this simple exercise in communication into a disaster. Some emails we receive have file attachments like this one. And when you click on that, your computer opens the file and it downloads a message, a picture, an animated greeting card, all kinds of things. Well, one day, Mary, an executive assistant in Dallas, received an email with an attached file labeled, I love you. That caught her attention. The thought did cross her mind that this could be an email prank. But what if it was from some secret admirer, someone who had a crush on her, maybe someone at the office? The message was just too intriguing to resist. So Mary clicked on that I love you icon. What did she discover? She had just been bitten by the love bug virus. Her computer was going down. And Mary was not alone. Thousands of people were affected by this computer virus at the same time. Computer systems all over the world were crashing. The English House of Commons, the US Department of Defense, they had to shut down parts of their systems to stamp out the infection. What did the love bug do? It unleashed a program inside people's computers that erased files. It destroyed files on the victim's hard drive. Some newspaper systems, for example, lost their entire photo archives. Airports were plagued by flight delays because of the virus. Businesses had to shut down to deal with the problem. But that's not all. This love bug had a nasty way of reproducing itself. It wormed its way into a victim's address book. It scanned down all the names and email addresses. And then it automatically sent itself to all those individuals. Mary in Dallas found that the I love you message, that file attachment, was being sent to all her company's business contacts in her name. It was humiliating. Computer viruses can cause worldwide havoc. One lone hacker with some kind of score to settle can create an incredible amount of electronic devastation. For example, another computer virus, the Melissa virus, rang up some $80 million in damages. I love you. It seemed like such a little thing a cute little message in a sea of other messages. It was a little lie, but it mushroomed into a big disaster. Little lies can produce big disasters. We are becoming more and more aware of that in our computerized world. And you know, our heads and our hearts are vulnerable in a very similar way. They can be affected. The information inside of us can be distorted. Sometimes we, too, allow little lies into our minds. They may not seem very important at first, but those lies can take root. They can start undermining our beliefs. They can start sabotaging our principles. Paul starts out the book of Romans by dealing with the basic human sin problem. And he talks about what can happen when we allow an unexamined assumption to settle in our minds. The Bible says in the book of Romans, in chapter 1, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. 
but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Paul here speaks of individuals who have evidence that God is real, but they turn away from that evidence. They refuse to acknowledge him in their lives. As a result, false beliefs darken their thinking, distort their thinking. They start making foolish decisions. Unexamined assumptions. Little lies can produce big disasters. Let me give you some very, very practical examples. How about this one? God is holding something back from me. Does that sound familiar? It probably doesn't, because this is a belief that few of us consciously acknowledge, but it's there at work all too often. This lie is triggered every time we feel the strong pull of temptation, every time we entertain the urge to do something that God says is wrong. We may give assent to the fact that God has our interests and our best interests at heart, and that's why he gives us moral principles. But in the back of our mind, we're wondering, maybe God is holding something back. It happened to Eve in the Garden of Eden. She kept looking at that forbidden fruit. Hmm, maybe God is holding something back from me. It happens to the man lingering by the flashing neon sign, exotic dancers. Maybe God is holding something back. It happens to the woman who wants to respond to the guy at the office who keeps flirting with her, who seems much more charming than her husband. Maybe God is holding something back. Now, if we were to take this belief out and stand it up in the light, we'd quickly disown it. Why? Of course the God of heaven is not denying anything good to us. That's ridiculous. He loves his children. But as a hidden assumption, this ridiculous attitude can go on tripping us up indefinitely. We give our assent in the pressure of the moment. We buy into the hoax. We sin. And then the lie burrows back deep into our minds, out of sight, waiting for its next opportunity to nudge us off track. Little lies can produce big disasters. Here's another virus that gets into our heads, like some of those computer viruses. Many times when tempted to do wrong, we'll tell ourselves very quietly that this is just a little misstep. It's no big deal. Why be troubled about it? Why be bothered about it? It's just a very little thing. We try to focus on the act itself and cut it off from its results. We just want to take this quick detour and bounce right back on the straight and narrow. We want time out from righteousness, a little break. But of course, that's the same old excuse our habits always make, just this once, week after week, year after year. As Samuel Johnson wrote, the chains of habit are generally too small to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. Did you get that? Chains of habit, like little strands of tape, one placed around our wrist, easily broken, second placed around our wrist, easily broken. But when you continue to tape the wrist, that wrist will be firmly held. Sin is like that. One strand, a second strand, a third strand, again. If that little lie really came out in the open, we'd quickly disavow any knowledge of its activities. It doesn't hold up in the light. Sin always matters in God's sight. C.S. Lewis wrote in the Screw Tape Letters, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Little lies can produce big disasters. And little lies tend to cluster around the weaknesses in our lives. They gather around specific problems. Little lies like, shouting makes me more of a man. Or I'm moody because I'm a woman. Or how about this one? Other people should meet my expectations. Little lies give aid and comfort to destructive habits. Little lies can produce 
big disasters. So what should we do about them? How can we keep these viruses from effect infecting us, from wreaking havoc in our minds? Well, remember this one thing. Lies keep working because they remain hidden, because they remain unexamined. They thrive when kept in semi-secrecy. So we need to throw a spotlight on them. We need to drag them out by the scruff of their neck and tell them off. Unless we consciously deal with these attitudes, they will continue to sabotage our best efforts. Too often, we'd rather not look at the lie that's giving aid and comfort to some habit. A man once made a pledge to his priest that he'd abstain from alcohol, but then he became terribly thirsty and slipped into a tavern. He ordered lemonade. As the bartender was preparing the drink, he whispered, and couldn't he put a little brandy in it? All unbeknownst to myself. What deception. Sometimes we don't want to take responsibility for those self-serving ideas that have slipped into our subconscious, all unbeknowns to ourselves. So what we need to do is this. Expose the lie to the light of day. Expose yourself to the light of God's truth, the light of His Word. See, God's Word is a moral revelation that throws light on our conduct. God's Word reveals truth. It reveals what's right, and it reveals what's wrong. Our lives may not be in harmony with God's Word, but, and we may deceive ourselves thinking that our lives are just fine. But when we come to God's Word and we see righteousness, we see truth, we see God's law, we see God's Word, God's Word exposes us to ourselves and to the lies that we've accepted. There is a wonderful promise God gives us about how we can counter lies, how we can keep them from sabotaging our good intentions. It's found in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. It quotes these words from our Lord to his people, and it says, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God wants to write his laws in your mind. He's capable of rewriting those damaged files inside of us. He's capable of overwhelming lies with his truth. Do you know what it means that God's going to write his law in our mind? It means that he is going to reveal his truth inside of us to expose those lies. Do you know what it means that God's going to write his law in our heart? It means that when we see his truth in all of its beauty, he will place a love in our hearts for that truth so we naturally want to follow his way rather than our own. So we need to expose ourselves to his principles. Let the truth shine in. Has that old lie, God is holding something back, been at work? Then overwhelm it with the truth of God's principles. Here is something from the Psalms. Take in this springtime portrait of nature as a picture of God's amazing generosity found in Psalm 65 and verses 9, 10, and 13. Here's one of the most amazing pictures in Scripture of a God who's a giver. It says, you care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. The meadows are covered with flocks and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. The rich variety of living things bears witness to a God who blesses. It tells us about a God who creates abundance. In Psalm 84, we see this expressed in terms of personal experience. Psalm 84 tells about this God again. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. God holds nothing good back from us. That's a truth we need to consciously acknowledge, consciously celebrate, 
use God's word to confront that old lie. My God opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. He brings fruit to the earth. He will lead me to a place of abundance. And here's the most powerful truth you can state. Listen to Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. Of all the passages in the Bible about God, this one summarizes who God is as clearly as any place else. Romans 8 verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Can we really imagine that the God who gave up his own beloved son to die on the cross is going to be stingy about other blessings? Impossible. He already emptied heaven. He already emptied his own heart. God is not holding back. There's no sin that can offer something better than what God has to give. So acknowledge clearly what you do believe. Your beliefs had better stand at attention and be counted. Otherwise, they'll be silently replaced. Truth affirmed counters that lie. That virus, God's truth affirm, sets you free. How about that other common lie? That belief that this wrong is just a little misstep. No big deal. Just a temporary little detour. Well, we've got to drag that assumption out of the closet. We've got to bring it out into God's light. The truth we must challenge it with is this. Two paths diverge at our feet. We have to make a choice about who to serve, and our actions take us down one of two roads. Here's something important to know from the book of Proverbs, chapter 4 and verses 18 and 19. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. The road to light and the road to darkness. There really are two ways. One leads us closer to God. The other leads us away from God. And scripture passages reinforce this point of view. The Bible writers try to help us look beyond this present temptation. What does it lead to? What's the end result? God's not going to cancel our ticket to heaven every time we take a sinful detour. But he does want us to concentrate on what our action says, what direction it points toward. Joshua reflected on that theme when he made his greatest speech to the Hebrews at Shechem, He urged them to renew their covenant with the Almighty. He asked them to think seriously about the alternative. We find that speech in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. Joshua says, And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua was saying, if you're not willing to follow God completely, then face the alternatives. You're either going to be serving the moon god, Nana, or Egypt's golden calf, or Apis, the sacred bull, or bloodthirsty Baal, and Ashtoreth demanding the sacrifice of children. Look at the choice you are making. That's what scripture pushes us toward. No fuzzy thinking about a little time off from the straight and narrow. We don't want to give that false belief, that sin, that virus, any room to work inside of us. We don't want it to create havoc with our attitudes and our emotions instead. We want to take one more step down that road that grows brighter and brighter until the full light of day. Our decisions, our choices do make a big difference. Little lies do produce huge disasters. 
let me tell you what happened when a psychology professor, Roger Buford, decided to apply this principle. He'd been telling other people how to improve their lives, but he was facing a chronic problem in his own. He and his wife found themselves quarreling all the time. They just couldn't get along, they were arguing, debating, and it didn't seem they could resolve their conflicts. Well, Roger decided to look at his own assumptions, at the beliefs in the back of his own mind, and he discovered something. He discovered that he believed their disagreements were primarily her fault. Now, isn't that the way in most marital conflicts? Why, it couldn't be my fault. It has to be my spouse's fault. That was Roger's standard operating principle. She was always the one to blame. If something went wrong, she was to blame. If they couldn't find the keys in the house, where did you put them? If their bills were excessive, why did you spend so much? If there was some problem with the children, why didn't you say that? So Roger had to drag that assumption out into the light of God's Word. He came across passages in the Bible that directly challenged the lie. There were words in the book of Proverbs that really hit home, where the wise man says, he who hates reproof is stupid. Proverbs 12, verse 1. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Another, a curse without cause does not alight. Proverbs 26, verse 2. Roger realized that he was always overreacting to criticism. He was becoming much, much too defensive. So he decided that he needed to reflect more and react less when conflicts came up. The next so time he and his wife had a disagreement, he remembered those words. He remembered those truths. They did make a difference in his mind. And he found himself reacting very differently. He didn't just get upset. He didn't just shut down. He tried to learn from what his wife was saying. What was she really trying to communicate? What was she really trying to share? And Roger found himself actually enjoying the process. It's time to take a good, hard look at our beliefs. The beliefs that have hunkered down in the back of our mind. It's time to do a bit of brain scanning. We need to check out what's in the hard drive of our minds. It's time to think about what you really want to affirm as opposed to what you've believed by default. Will you decide to let the truth of God's Word challenge all your assumptions? Will you decide to overwhelm those hidden lies with God's light? As the psalmist says, God desires truth in our inmost being. God's truth can get down deep. You know, Jesus once said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The truth sets us free from our lies. Those lies can be lies about ourselves, lies in which we relate to other people. We can believe we're all right and they're all wrong. Those lies can be lies that justify sins in our lives, in which we say, what's wrong with that? And we deceive ourselves. Those lies can even be in areas of religious belief, where we've accepted some tradition, some aspect of religious doctrine, and we cling to it just because we've always believed it. God wants to expose those lies in the light of his word. He can write his law on your heart. He can open up your heart to him so that your mind is sensitive to his word, so that you will bring every presupposition, every assumption, every falsehood, every lie into the light of God's truth. Do you want to do that? Do you want to say, dear Lord, whatever assumption I have, whatever lie I've been cherishing, whatever falsehood I've been embracing, oh God, I need your truth. Oh God, I need your mind. I need my thoughts sensitive to the very thoughts of God. I want to think God's thoughts. I want God's truth to fill my mind. I want God's truth to stir me to be a better man, a better woman. Would you like to make that decision right now that you are going to follow God's truth? 
why not make that decision as we pray? Dear Father, thank you for caring about what goes on deep inside of us. Thank you for your ability to cleanse our hearts and renew our minds with your truth. We need your help. We need your light. We need you to expose those little lies that can become so destructive inside of us, that can keep us from walking in your truth and your light in your way. So we open up ourselves right now to the truths of your word. Make them sink into our inmost place. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Until next week, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.